through the early 2000s, Frogger really struggled to find a place in the modern world. Konami clearly wanted to take the classic character and turn him into a big franchise, but at first, they really didn't know how to do it. Around this time, Frogger would aimlessly bounce between multiple types of gameplay and even several different art styles. This series had no idea what it wanted to be. The first two on PlayStation took a promising direction, expanding on the simple tile-hopping gameplay of the arcade original, but all of that was thrown out the window with this infamous reboot. It was riddled with glitches, uncomfortably perverse writing, and terrible graphics. But even with those things aside, it was still a boring and generic platformer at its very core. A Frogger hit rock bottom, but while this little frog was struggling on console, there was a short timeline of portable Frogger games for the Game Boy Advance, each of which taking a very different approach than the recent disaster on PS2. There are four Frogger games we're going to be talking about today. Uh, first up, we have Frogger's Adventures, Temple of the Frog. When I was a kid, I didn't really have that many Game Boy Advance games. It feels like I only had the thing for like two years before the DS came out. But in my short time with the Game Boy Advance, I did play a lot of Mario World, a ton of Pro Skater 3, and a bunch of Temple of the Frog. Now this right here is actually the one and only Frogger game that I grew up playing. I, I had this game as a kid, and I remember playing quite a bit of it. Uh, this was more or less my first and only exposure to what the Frogger series was, and I do remember coming out of it with a fairly good opinion on Frogger, so based on what I remember, it's probably at least decent. It seems like a lot of people grew up with this one. A quick Google search and I found out that, weirdly enough, this is the second best-selling Frogger game of all time, and one of the best-selling games in the Game Boy Advance by extension. That's actually really interesting. God, now I really want to see the game's any good or not now, so uh, yeah, let's start a new file and see how Temple of the Frog holds up. Ooh, that title screen music, that is funky, I like that. So despite having a separate canon from The Great Quest, Temple of the Frog still seems to draw a lot of influence from it, at least in means of character design, I guess. Uh, Frogger's design here closely resembles his design from The Great Quest, but it's tweaked a little bit. I still don't think this design looks all that great, but I guess it's a little better at the very least. The other characters are all lifted straight from The Great Quest too. There's Lumpy, Zippy the Turtle, Lily the Fairy, these guys are all back, but these are different versions of these characters. They look exactly the same, but they certainly don't act the same way. And by that I mean they act normal and not weird as hell. The story begins with Lumpy the Toad explaining the Frogger that Firefly Swamp is dying because a grim reaper named Mr. D stole the elements that keep the swamp alive. Interesting how Mr. D is the main villain this time. That's actually another character from the Great Quest. I completely forgot to mention this part in my video about the game, but there's this one part where you find the grim reaper himself in this ancient tree cave, and after you beat him, he takes off his hood, and it's you! He's you! He is Frogger! Like, you are him! I guess they're going for, like, the whole self-understanding trial, a Luke Skywalker in the cave sort of thing, but it made no sense to be shoehorned into this plot, and then forgotten about after Frogger takes nothing from it and does not develop as a character at all. So that throwaway villain from that throwaway part of the game is now the main villain in this game, but again, like the other characters, this is Mr. D in name only. He's really a different character using the same likeness. Uh, now he's pretty much just an evil skeleton that you gotta stop. That's all. It's a super simple plot, which is sort of what I expected since it's a Game Boy Advance game. You don't really need much here, just an excuse to leave the swamp, see the world, and fight some bosses. I will say though, while Frogger looks like the same character he was in The Great Quest, he is much more tolerable here. Instead of being driven by his gross, selfish desires, he's now motivated by wanting to save his friends, and he takes the adventure as an excuse to finally see the world outside the swamp. Thankfully, this game returns turns to that tile-hopping formula, once again with 2D graphics, instead of it being 3D like on PlayStation. And wow, dude, these controls feel super good. They're really tight and precise. Every tap of that D-pad gives you one imminent and snappy hop, accompanied with a satisfying croak sound to help give the player some one-to-one -one feedback. Tapping away at that D-pad to propel Frog around the stage feels incredibly good here, even better than it did in the PlayStation games. Zipping around the stage and dodging enemies and obstacles, it's literally never felt better. Frogger's also got a couple of other moves too. You can use your tongue with the B button to lick up butterflies that'll give you extra lives. You can also press the A button to do a super hop, which will skip a tile. And finally, you can rotate the direction Frogger is facing with the R and L buttons. This is awesome because one thing I didn't like about Swampy's Revenge was that there was no way to orient yourself. If you wanted to jump over 
a gap that you weren't already facing the direction of, you had to jump off of the cliff and then hit the jump button really fast. I mean, it did work consistently, but it always just felt kind of wrong, like it wasn't going to work all the time, even if it did, if that makes sense. But either way, this rotation move feels much better, and it's super responsive too, so turning another direction to hop in the midst of all the action, it's always very easy to pull off, and very satisfying at that. The move set is fairly simple, but it's pretty effective. There's only three real moves, but the game makes sure to get the best out of most of them. That super hop is really gratifying. Oh, that springy sound it makes. Oh, it's so fun to do. You can also use this move for jumping over certain enemies, and while there will be moments where that is going to be obvious and deliberate, you can also use it just to hop over projectiles in general if you're in a pinch, so on top of being a fun way to navigate the area, it's also another way your reflexes can help Frogger avoid danger. Like the other characters, the enemies were also lifted from the Great Quest, but while they were really disgusting and strange looking in 3D, the 2D sprites at least look a little bit more flattering. Aside from the game reusing the artwork from the Great Quest, I'd say this is a fairly solid looking game. The details are vivid, and the colors are vibrant, and each world also has a distinct theme and color palette to help them all stand out. I like how Frogger gets a little diving helmet for the underwater level, that's a really cute detail. You can't use your tongue here though, since the helmet's in the way, but the level makes sure to let you collect 1-ups by simply hopping on them instead here. Actually, you know what, now that I've spent an entire level without that move, I'm realizing how little it adds to the game. I feel like a tongue whip could have done a little bit more than just getting extra lives. The level design here is pretty similar to Frogger 2 Swampy's Revenge. They're all linear levels, but you'll have to collect a number of items along the way in order to finish it. You can pick up these frog coins, which you'll need enough of them to enter the final level, and then you'll have to grab each element in the stage before you can finish it. If you don't have them all by the time you reach the end, it'll roadblock you until you backtrack to get them all, and that can be a real pain in the ass, because a lot of these obstacles are designed to be navigated one way, but not the other, so if you miss one and can't finish, you may as well restart the level. Luckily, that's not going to happen very often, though, because most of the elements are either in plain sight, or they're on an off-beaten path that the level usually makes pretty clear as the way that you should go first, so unless you're really not paying attention, this likely won't happen to you. So while you can obviously expect navigating patterns of walking enemies, there's also a good number of stage gimmicks to offer a variety of challenge, like conveyor belts, tiles that crumble under your feet, spike traps, and fire spouts. Jesus, Frogger doesn't just die in this game, he gets freaking obliterated, dude. Still nothing on Zapper, though, like, dude, they kill the crap out of this guy. Ugh. The difficulty curve in this game is okay, I guess? The challenge does ramp up a fairly good deal towards the end, but it never really gets all that tough. The challenge is fair, and whenever I died, I did feel like it was my fault, but even still, I never really died that much, because each area was fairly simple to learn and get by. The only part I found a little bit frustrating is when you have to ride this magic car it. You go a little bit too fast to be able to react to this one chunk of obstacles here, and I had to restart a number of times before I had it all memorized. But even then, it was only a very small and brief annoyance. Only hung me up for a couple of minutes, but honestly, I felt a little bit disappointed. You know, a quick bout of memorization? That was the hardest thing this game could throw at me? Really? Well, there's also boss fights, I guess, and they're honestly not bad. Each one often throws a series of obstacles and attack patterns at you that you simply have to dodge before, like, pressing the big button or something. It's very simple, but it works quite well. I thought the shark boss was really cool. You have to hit all the switches using the whirlpools to warp around the stage, but the shark swims in a big circle, undoing all the switches you've been hitting, so you have to outrun him and do it all as quickly as possible. This boss fight has you collecting more blue gems than this other guy. If he runs into you, you get temporarily stunned. You just gotta collect more than him before time's up, and you win. As simple as these fights are, it is still pretty cool to see them try to have a little bit of variety with them. The final boss fight with Mr. D is actually really fun. The attack patterns are easily some of the most challenging the game offers, and the idea of using the elements against him is also really fun. He'll give chase as you hit some switches, you line him up, and you try to get him to fall into a trap. I think this boss fight is honestly one of the best parts of the game, and honestly, if you ask me, that kind of makes sense. It's the best part. Why not save it for last, right? Frogger heads back to the swamp, where the friends he met on the journey celebrate and thank him. Frogger explains that it was really cool getting to see the world around him, but he can't forget that sometimes it's also fun to head back home, see your friends, and relax, because that's what really matters. Hold up, is that character development? Yeah, a tiny bit at the very least. Uh, it's funny how the Game Boy Advance game could figure that out when the big mainline PS2 game couldn't. Yeah, overall, I'd say that was pretty good. The controls are really tight, the boss fights are cool. It's really fun to play, but uh, my only major gripes with it, I'd say, is that, firstly, it's really short. It's only an hour long. And secondly, while some areas offer a decent amount of challenge, I do wish it got a little bit more challenging. Uh, it's a little bit on the easy side, a little bit on the short side, but overall, I'd say it's still good.
Okay, next up we have Frogger Advance The Great Quest. A while Temple of the Frog came out after The Great Quest, this Game Boy Advance port of it came out after even then, making it an oddly late port. I mean, considering that they've already begun making Frogger games on Game Boy Advance, I don't know why they bothered with this. Oh, that's why they got a different studio to do it. Vicarious Visions, now there's a familiar face. A while they're best known these days for their incredible work with remakes, back in the day they were making Game Boy Advance ports of pretty much everything imaginable, including Tony Hawk, which actually had some pretty solid ports. Again, Pro Skater 3, Game Boy Advance, that's my jam right there. The plot in this version is really just an abridged version of the plot from the console version. The fairy frog mothers help a frogger find a princess who can turn him into a prince, that's it. You'll run into a handful of the characters from the PS2 version, but each of their story arcs has been greatly simplified to keep the pacing much faster. This version of The Great Quest is a side-scroller. I find that's more or less what they always did with Game Boy Advance ports of console platformers. They just made it more or less the same thing, but as a side-scroller. And as far as side-scrollers go, Oh, this is... well, it's playable, but it certainly isn't very interesting. It's very straightforward, insultingly so, honestly. You just follow the trail of coins to the end of a level, you jump across a couple of platforms, take out the occasional enemy, and that's pretty much it. Your dumbass frog foo is replaced with a tongue whip attack that you can aim in several different directions, which I very much prefer. I have no idea why the hell he was doing karate instead of this before. As you make your way through the game, you'll unlock more moves, like that unsettling floating move. Yeah, that's back. Just as weird looking looking as it was before. Those magic runes also return, but this time they're used for freezing enemies in place so you can either beat them faster or step on them like a platform. Not a bad idea, I mean it's not terribly original, but it does work and it is kind of fun. The graphics, they are bad. It uses what appears to be a similar art style to the DK Country games, you know, like digitizing the 3D animations into 2D sprites, and while the animation does have a lot of frames and is quite smooth, the pixelated sprites do not look very good at all, and the sprite work on the environments is so aimless. It looks like they just spilled a barf bucket of pixels everywhere. Donkey Kong had composition. Everything felt like it was carefully planned to make that transition to sprite work as smoothly as possible. And even today, it still looks really great. But here, it looks like they just hit a button without making any adjustments at all. And it ended up looking really chaotic and messy. And yeah, that's all there really is to it. It's just a clunky, simple, ugly as hell, and very easy 2D side-scroller. You have a ton of health, and there's bugs you can eat everywhere, so it's pretty unlikely you'll ever die. I only died two times in the entire game, and both times were on the final boss. After Frogger rescues the princess, she gives him a big old kiss, and uh, nothing happens. Oh, to get the oh to get the good ending, you have to get an A plus on every level, which means making sure to get tons of collectibles on your way to the end. It's not very hard to do, honestly, but I really don't care enough to go back to do it. And honestly, I like this ending a lot more. It's so funny to me the idea of Frogger coming all this way and convincing a princess to kiss him, just so nothing can happen because the whole legend was bullshit the whole time. She even gets mad about it after her closing line being a disgusted, "I kissed a frog," which is hilarious. Just like Temple of the Frog, this game is also really short. I think my total playtime was like 45 minutes, but yeah, I probably don't have to tell you that this game is not worth playing. It's not like borderline offensive like the PS2 version is, but it's just as uninteresting when it comes to the gameplay. And plus, like, you really play the PS2 version for how bad it is. This is just a weird in-between. It's too bad to be fun, but not bad enough to be worth playing in that way, right? Uh, in the midst of everything else Vicarious Visions was doing at the time, you could really tell this was nothing more than a paycheck for them, so I really don't blame them for half-assing it. Okay, what do we have next? Uh, oh, Frogger's Adventures 2, The Lost Wand. Uh, this one's a direct sequel to Temple of the Frog, and likewise, it shares the same type of gameplay. Frogger has once again seen a redesign. Uh, normally, I think it'd be a little bit soon for that, but this is an exception. Uh, let's dunk that Great Quest design in the trash, because I think we can all agree this looks much, much better. This game's opening features pre-rendered 3D scenes. Frogger's relaxing at his frog-shaped house when he wishes for another adventure to go on. It's then that these bizarre, magical practices start to occur. Doves flying out of the fridge, flowers come out of his TV remote, what is going on? We then meet this cute little wizard guy named Hocus, who tells us that the Eternity Wand has been shattered, causing magic to go haywire in Frogger's world. Frogger must then work with Hocus to recollect the wand fragments and make everything go back to normal. I like how this game has a little bit more plot this time. There's more dialogue, more scenes, and the writing is pretty cute. But while there is more of it than Temple of the Frog, it still does take a backseat for the gameplay. And the gameplay is pretty much identical to Temple of the Frog. Again, 
again with linear stages, a live system, and checkpoints sprinkled throughout each level. Though this time, the collectibles in each level are optional. Instead, they open a bonus level where you can grind for more lives. So those moments of clunky backtracking are avoided entirely. Frogger's tongue move has been greatly improved. It whips out much further, and instead of being only for getting one-ups, you can now pick up all sorts of items with it, as well as activate platforms and whatnot. Other than that, though, it's more or less the same as Temple of the Frog. You still have the longer hop with the A button, and the shoulder buttons will once again rotate Frogger in place. The sprite work has seen some tweaks. Uh, Frogger's sprite is now a little pudgier, a little cuter. His facial expressions come through much more prominently. It's always nice to look down at my character and see a, a content little smile on his face, and I also love how he bobs his head around if you let him idle. The character designs no longer borrow from the Great Quest. I'd say they all look a lot more appealing now, but uh, sometimes the graphics can be really bright and hard on the eyes. See, the Game Boy Advance often had brighter than usual graphics because back before portable consoles had those built-in lights, they had to make the game easier to see somehow. That's why those Super Nintendo ports always looked a little bit brighter and kind of washed out. So I understand why it looks like this, but even by GBA standards, some of these levels can be way too harsh to look at, especially when there's a bunch of lava on screen. The animation is really distracting. I guess it is a lot less of a problem when you're playing on a smaller screen, you know, like what's intended, but it's still pretty distracting nonetheless. But that's really my only gripe with this thing, otherwise I had a really good time with it. On top of being a longer game, it also offers much more challenge than Temple of the Frog did. The enemy patterns are way more interesting, and while they can be difficult to navigate sometimes, it's always totally fair. The camera does a great job of showing you everything you need to see at any given time, and the controls are once again very snappy and precise. Boss fights are also even better than they were last time too. I was really impressed they were able to make these boss fights so unique from each other, despite how simple those core mechanics are. One has you on the attack, whipping everybody with your tongue. Uh, this one has you quickly moving these bombs around before they blow up. This one's all about leaping between platforms to dodge each wave of attacks. They all feel totally different from one another, and they're really good fun. The only one I found a bit annoying was this piano boss. It's kind of like Simon says, you gotta remember what he plays and then play the same thing back to him, but the last series of notes was really fast, and it made me restart the fight enough times to get a little bit irritated with it. Whew, the final moments of this game are no joke. They're really tough, but unlike Frogger on PlayStation, I never got frustrated with it. I always welcome a good challenge, but the challenge has to be fair, and this game gave me exactly what I was looking for in that regard. I really like this game, dude. Like, this is a blast. Uh, God, Lost Wand is precisely everything I'm looking for in a modern Frogger game. They pretty much took everything that worked in Temple of the Frog, they tightened it up a little bit, they add a ton more, and they made it way more challenging while keeping it fair. That's what I need in Frogger. Uh, I'd say if Temple of the Frog is like a pair of training wheels, then this... This right here is actually riding the bike, and it is a blast. And I guess we just got one more, uh, Frogger's Journey, the Forgotten Relic. While at a glance it does look very similar to Temple of the Frog in the Lost Wand, this is actually a much different kind of game. It does still use that exact same tile hopping gameplay, but this one is more of an adventure game with RPG elements. There's NPCs you can talk to, items and upgrades to collect, a central hub area to connect all the levels, and much more focus on the story. Frogger's design remains pretty much the same as it was in the Lost Wand, but the 3D rendered cutscenes were opted out in favor of 2D illustrations, and these all look really great. The simple cartoon look is a really good fit for Modern Frogger. Really didn't need that close up of his feet though, why did you draw that? The story's beginning is pretty ridiculous. Again, Frogger's sitting around at home wishing for something exciting to happen, which apparently is the plot of every freaking one of these Frogger games, and a plane crashes into his yard, completely demolishing his front lawn. That's why you be careful what you wish for, dude. The pilot gets out and actually has the nerve to grill Frogger for not not having a runway, as if that makes sense and is reason to do this to the poor guy, and then he delivers him a letter from his grandpa. It explains that he's been undergoing some exciting research and wants Frogger to come along to go on a fun little quest to uncover a mystery. Though when Frogger arrives in town, it turns out his grandfather has gone missing. Frogger then embarks on a journey to find his grandpa, discovering what it was his grandfather was researching along the way. You know what, that's actually a really similar plot to Star Tropics of all things. The gameplay is split up into two major components. There's a linear action stages that play pretty similar to the uh, previous Game Boy Advance games, but now there's these new town sections where you'll talk to NBCs, look for clues, unlock gear, and find the next area. Frogger stumbles upon this old relic called the Opart, an ancient device that his grandfather was researching. An evil weasel named Eric is also trying to track down the Opart relics, hoping to use their power to create weapons. I think it's pretty cool the game actually has a main villain throughout the plot, but unfortunately you don't get to see him that much throughout the game. He's more so only mentioned, I think a couple of more encounters to explore the relationship between him and Frogger 
longer could have been really fun, but as it stands, you only see them like two times. I guess there are a lot of other fun characters that do get a lot of screen time though. Uh, there's Leanne, who will help you decode memos left by your grandpa. There's Dusty, the mechanic doggy dude. He'll turn any relics you find into new equipment. And who could forget my favorite little penguin dude? This guy looks like he's straight out of Club Penguin. <laughs> I kind of love him. Uh, he's a traveling merchant who will sell you items and aid you on your quest. The dialogue and characters, while definitely intended for younger audiences, are still very cute and enjoyable. It's really cool seeing them build a whole world around Frogger. Like, this is the first time I felt like I actually got to see a little bit of that, and that was really cool. Though I guess the story sections can be a tad repetitive. It seems like you have to do the exact same thing between every action stage. You bring the relic to Dusty, get a new item, you talk to Leanne, and then you talk to every NPC in town looking for a clue, and then you can go to the next level. It's really the same thing every time. The gameplay here feels like a slightly slower version of Temple of the Frog, but instead of having two dedicated moves, you'll now unlock a variety of moves that you'll map to the A and B buttons, kind of like the Game Boy Zelda games. Once again, you've got your super hop and the tongue whip equivalent, you know, for picking up items and moving platforms and whatever, but there's also other items like a shield for blocking projectiles, a hammer for breaking through barriers, a glove for pushing blocks, and scuba gear to go underwater. These underwater levels are easily the worst parts of this game. They're so freaking slow, and a lot of these enemy patterns are pretty unorthodox. They can be really difficult to get through when you only move so fast. You can also only use one item at a time while underwater, since one button has to be occupied by the scuba gear, which makes no sense because the button doesn't do anything when it's equipped, so why can't it just be a passive effect so I get both of my buttons back? It'd be like if the Goron tunic and the shield had to occupy two of your C buttons. Like, what would be the point of that? These block puzzles here also really overstayed their welcome. I actually do like block puzzles. I think I have Professor Layton to thank for that. I've always found them kind of cathartic in a way. This, though, is way too many. Every time I'd go to the next room, it's like, oh my god, there's another one? How long is this gonna go on for? Those are my biggest of complaints, though. Otherwise, I do think the items add a lot of great variety here. The shield was used in some really cool ways when you gotta rotate all the way around to guard your back as you make your way past these projectiles. You can also bring any new items you have to previously explored areas to find items that'll increase your maximum health. Yeah, that's another weird thing about this game. Instead of having instant deaths and a checkpoint system like before, this game tosses out the lives in favor of a health bar. And now you start over if you run out of health instead of lives, and there's plenty of health pickups throughout each level, so it strikes a very different kind of balance than the previous two did. I'm kind of split on this decision. On one hand, I really don't like how you can now just tank a hit to skip certain patterns. Even if you had a lot of lives stocked up before, you still died in one hit, and that was really important because it meant that you had to solve each pattern successfully at least once each. Here, it's a lot more slack with that. But at the same time, I guess it does make the stakes a little bit higher in, like, a different kind of way? Like, you might feel like you can be more reckless at first, but after realizing you really do have to keep your health up or you'll be doing the entire stage over, I did end up having just as much incentive to perform well and avoid taking damage. I do like the instant death checkpoint system a lot more, though, because it feels much more rewarding, knowing that I actually had to learn and overcome each area completely. I never had the incentive to get lazy and run through enemies. That opportunity is just not there, and I very much prefer that. Overall, I do think this one is quite good, too. It's just very different than the other ones, so uh, if you're looking for something a little more action-focused, something challenging, I'd say play Lost One instead, but if you want something a little slower, more puzzles, more story, a little cuter, I'd say go with this one. It's also easily the longest one of these. Took me about four hours to beat this one, but I imagine without those repetitive town sections, that probably would have been knocked down quite a bit. Overall, without a doubt, my pick of the best one is easily the Lost Wand. Dude, I had a freaking blast with this game. It's simple, challenging, and effective as hell, and the story, while much lighter on it than Forgotten Relic, is still very adorable. Honestly, I'd say this is hands down the best Frogger game I've even reviewed in this series so far. I absolutely recommend it to everybody who wants a good challenge. I'd say The Forgotten Relic is my number two pick. Uh, the action isn't as interesting, and the story might drag a little bit to some people, but it was really cool seeing them expand on Frogger's moveset and the world around him. And the story was pretty fun in a Saturday morning cartoon way. It kind of reminded me of, like, DuckTales and whatever. Obviously, my number three pick's gonna have to be Temple of the Frog. It is competent and well-made, but 
It's really short and fairly easy. I wouldn't bother with it unless you wanted like an easy introduction to The Lost One because in the end, it's really just an easier, less interesting version of that game. As for The Great Quest, I don't think I need to tell you guys that it is not worth playing. It's not bad enough to be hilarious, but it is bad enough not to be of any fun. I am super happy the majority of these games did follow a direction closer to what Swampy's Revenge was going for. And well, with that said, why don't we do a bonus one? Zapper on Game Boy Advance, yeah. I mean, Zapper is the true sequel to Swampy's Revenge after all, so let's see how the Game Boy Advance version holds up. As I expected, it's very similar to the console version. You got the tile hopping, the zap move, that high jump, and you have to collect six eggs to finish each level. But the gameplay, it's nowhere near as snappy or quick. Like, this is as fast as you can possibly go. I am mashing the D-pad as fast as I can. And to compensate for the slow movement, the enemy patterns are very simple and not very challenging. And buddy, let me tell you, coming off of these Frogger games, this is just way too slow. Well, when I guess it comes to Zapper, you guys should stick with the console version. This just feels like a watered down and inferior version of it, instead of something that works really well as its own thing. Well, I guess Frogger had the edge over Zapper in the end, at least on Game Boy Advance, that is. But uh, yeah, I hope moving forward, we'll see the console games take a similar direction to some of these Game Boy Advance games. I think it is a great direction for the series, and I do feel like there's a little bit more you can do with it too. So we'll be returning to console Frogger next time with Frogger Beyond. Uh, this game came out after Temple of the Frog, but before The Lost Wand. An interesting spot on the Frogger timeline where it seems like they were finally starting to figure things out. But that's the thing. Was this before, during, or after they figured things out? Was this good, bad, or somewhere in between? That I do not know, so I'm going to be very excited in figuring that out next time with Frogger Beyond. Yo, what's up? Uh, thank you so much for watching the whole video. Uh, definitely you did that because you're here at the end. Uh, yeah, dude, like, Frogger Lost One is a dope-ass game, and I think it's, like, my favorite Frogger game ever so far. I can't wait for that to maybe change. Frogger Beyond may or may not be that. Might be the next one, but, man, I'm stoked. I got a Patreon.